I've been blessed in my life. A lot of people can say that, but I mean it truly. My particular journey is one that I doubt many have followed, since it meanders without real rhyme or reason, but simply an innate desire to respond when a door opens. Some might call it dumb luck, others might just call it dumb, as I've been asked by implication over the years, well, what do you hope to do with that? Um, a cradle Christian from the Bible Belt in a staunchly Republican, socially conservative, biblically-based Episcopal family, yes, that does exist. Um, after a lackluster undergraduate career, I swore off college forever. Ah, just saying that reminds me of the well-known Yiddish proverb, we plan and God laughs. Well, God heartily belly laughs at my expense to this day. A couple of years later, as my then boyfriend played Sunday softball in what used to be Peabody High School sin lot, I shagged an errant ball that had flown across the street under the grassy shade of this august seminary, and without realizing it, I knew in my heart that this is where I needed to be. Thus, upon marrying that Roman Catholic boyfriend, I entered seminary to earn a master's degree, gobbling up every church history course offered, and then went on to get a second master's in library science. Newly minted degrees in hand, I landed immediately at an Anglican seminary, then at Pitt's library science department, then back here to PTS's Barber Library for a short stint. My third pregnancy interrupted that particular experience then moved to a uh, Catholic University library where I was the liaison to the theology department. While doing this, I had an incredibly supportive husband and three children at home who were not so supportive because they were below the age of seven. So that seemed like an opportune time to undertake the grueling rigors of a PhD in religious studies with a focus on gender and Jewish studies. D daft, I know. At the end of it, I was like my own walking ecumenical council. So I felt imminently qualified when I accepted a job at an Eastern Catholic seminary to teach scripture and run the library. Again, I say, ha, I could not have been more wrong. Let me now disavow any notion you might have about how, well I, got, about how I got here, and having gotten to this moment, how well suited for it I was. I would be remiss if I failed to acknowledge that none of this would have been possible without the help and encouragement that I received along the way. My husband, classmates here at PTS, uh, instructors and mentors. The remarkable thing about all of that is that these mentors have chiefly been men, which for a feminist is a rather transgressive thing to say, but it's true, especially now as the first Protestant female faculty at an Eastern Catholic seminary, I am well aware that my hiring creates a bit of a hullabaloo and perhaps still does, but I continue to be humbled by the support that I receive from the priests with whom I work. Secondly, to my academic qualifications, what I didn't know about Eastern Christianity in general, and the Eastern Catholic Church in particular, was both vast and deep. It was at one and the same time intellectually appalling and personally humbling. I say personally humbling because I myself have been gifted with certain abilities, but singing is not one of them. I, alas, have absolutely no singing voice whatsoever, completely tone deaf. In fact, I rarely get song lyrics correct, let alone the tunes. It's one of the reasons that I do not doubt that God has a very sincere and active sense of humor. At the Byzantine Catholic Seminary of St. Cyril and Methodius, Byzantine a cappella ch chanting isn't done simply on special occasions. It is, in fact, the norm for all liturgical worship. And just for fun, they regularly bust out church Slavonic just to keep things interesting. Therefore, liturgical participation for me is a regular act of humility. I tell my students who ever so thoughtfully press pages of liner notes upon me during divine liturgy that my silence is actually for their benefit, lest I cause my brother to sin through subjecting to my flat discordant melodies. Augustine may have said, he who sings prays twice although some argue that the quote is, he who sings well prays twice. And I'm fairly certain he didn't have me in mind. Suffice to say, little, very little of what I've done in the previous 15 years prepared me for the unbelievable 
and fantastic journey into Eastern Christianity that has been my life for the past 10 years. And there it is. God can take clay and make a miracle, or in my case, a member of a Catholic theology faculty forming men for ordained priestly ministry. This alumni event has presented me with the opportunity to reflect upon some of this from my own perspective. With that in mind, I want to share what this moment means to me if I can. St. Augustine, in the City of God, defined theologia as reasoning or discussion concerning God. In reality, this isn't the purview of the academy. Theology is, in fact, what all Christians do. Our lives are witness to and a reflection of our continuing dialogue with God. Therefore, we here today are all in the business of theologia in every little detail of thought and action, which would be excruciatingly simple if life meant more to our wants and needs. If everything went the way we wanted, it would be so easy to love that neighbor like ourselves. If we had more time or more money, a bigger car, better job, lost 15 pounds, or were really recognized for the great people we really are, then everything would be good and right. I could just get on with this business of praising God and doing good and reflecting that appropriate Christian theologia without having to worry about all those other things, thank you very much. But we all know it doesn't work that way. Just leaving the church aside for the moment, right now in particular, we live in a historical and political space that is bursting at the seams with conflict as well as profound moral dilemmas. If it were not enough that the world is experiencing transformation at a mind-numbing rate, we, the people of the church, are also on the cusp of some really weighty and difficult issues. I need not outline them here, but as intelligent people of faith living in America right now, I'm fairly certain you can figure out what one or two of them might be. Sadly, people question this whole church thing all the time. People outside the church, people inside the church, we ourselves are constantly assessing what we do, how we do it, and if we are the least bit reflective, why we do it. I have heard many students, as well as clergy, laity, and religious, re reduce this down to a, one of many simplistic formulas, such as the church is, exists as a barricade against change. The church is the only continuing city. And for many, that necessitates a black and white dichotomy. The world is bad, consumed by a litany of social, political, and moral ills, all of which threaten the very fabric of the faith. The task of the church, then, is to take a stance against the world, to put up her considerable defenses, and to quote one priest, to pit the church against this lost, godless world. Or as a choir member once put it to me, apostolic witness is in our church alone. Anyone who follows fill-in-the-blank vilified denomination that you like will find only death. Making me wonder if folks only come to church out of fear rather than the warm and loving embrace of Christ. While there are merits to militancy and hellfires, I've thought a lot about the biblical perspective and what it is that the church has to share with the world. So let me start by saying that the biblical writers were no strangers to the kind of external pressures exerted by living in proximity to non-believers. They also knew what it meant to be actively oppressed and persecuted for their faith. As well we know, that oppression most often took the form of excruciating physical torment rather than our modern and perhaps more insidious existential and psychological alienation. Therefore, the Bible has a lot to say about our response to uncertainty and anxiety in the face of dynamic social change. So let me start with a quote from the book of James. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you, whereas you do not know about tomorrow. What is your life? For you are as a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. On the face of it, James offers a rather doer perspective on life. However, we can dig deeper here. Most of us stop at that first phrase, the one about humbling ourselves and exalt, being exalted before God. But look at that second part. Whereas you do not know about tomorrow, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. This is a rather poetic way of conceptualizing who and what life is all about. Now James, a writer that today might be dismissed as a bleeding heart liberal, all that moral language about caring for the others and all, he's usually a more pragmatic, straight from the hip kind of guy. 
where does he get this more imaginative sounding language? One of the things I really love about doing biblical studies is discovering over and over again what really good readers and interpreters the New Testament writers are of the old. And thus, all the more impetus for us to read and understand the scriptures that Jesus and his followers read and knew. In point of fact, the book of James bears an uncanny resemblance to a number of the wisdom writings that we find in the Old Testament, which would explain some of these more expressive turns of phrase. And this passage from James is one of those moments. It's a near duplicate of Ecclesiastes 9, verses 7 to 10. Now, Ecclesiastes is one of those books that most of us pass over quickly as we move from Proverbs and Psalms in a rush to get to the prophets or the Gospels or pretty much anything else. Uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes is traditionally considered a bit of a gloomy Gus. He has taken the measure of his life and found that it is all wanting. In his words, it is a puff of smoke. This is how he opens his book. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation comes and a generation goes, but the earth remains forever. Now the Hebrew word here is translated into English as vanity, though it isn't vanity. That is merely the paraphrase that is intended to capture the essence of the word chevel. Chevel in Hebrew literally means smoke or vapor. That's where James is getting this imagery. Thus, a truer reading might be vapor of vapor or smoke of smoke, all is smoke, but that's more clunky than poetic. The word is actually an onomatopoeia. It's literally intended to reproduce the sound that a breath makes, chevel. What is breath? It is brief. It is un insubstantial, fleeting, like a shadow, something that is there but not able to be captured again. It's a real thing, but nearly unquantifiable. How does one measure a vapor, or smoke, or breath? We think we make it, but in reality, it makes us. Without breath, we have no existence, no reality. Once breath leaves us, we are gone. We don't have an English word that adequately expresses this, so translators are left to describe what it's intending to articulate rather than when render a word-for-word -word equivalency. What the translators are striving for is this, the cynical briefness of life, a grasping after smoke or the wind or a breath as an expression of forestalling death, the ultimate reality. The essence of life is, in fact, emptiness, a vanity in which we willingly participate when we seek to grasp the flickering flame that is our lives, to make it regular and meaningful, and in some sense, expressing our lasting reality. But what is it that is regular and predictable? According to Ben Franklin, nothing is certain but death and taxes. That's a fairly bleak assessment on things, and one that I think Ecclesiastes, uh, as well as Ben Franklin, have been credited with fostering. However, if we look closer, we find that James, as well as Ecclesiastes, are working to show us the wisdom of faith. To put this in the modern Id idiom, this is plumbing the depths between needs and wants. That is to say, we want to have a life that is meaningful and valued, and in a sense, beautiful, because we can understand that and in some way reassure ourselves that we exercise a modicum of control over it. It's based on the stuff of this world, the things that we can see work for, manage, and command. But what, in fact, do we need? This is where I contend that Ecclesiastes has wrongly been considered a mope fest. Oh, I should have gone there. In a nutshell, here's what he says. Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain literally the word there is vaporous life, that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Again I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge. But time and chance happen to them all. This is wisdom literature of the best kind. The writer of Ecclesiastes has spent his life seeking the acclaim of the world. He has been celebrated for his successful career, 
has had multiple relationships with women, amassed all the material wealth that money can buy and to what end. He now recognizes that nothing he can do will keep the inevitable from happening. He cannot stop time. In the end, he will die the same as any pauper in the street. He ruefully realizes that death, as they say, is the great leveler. His libido, his money, his experiences, his intellect, none of that will keep him from death. So, he concludes, for if a man lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that will come is a puff of smoke. So, says Ecclesiastes, what are we to do with this glum bit of information? Be morose and lament the passage of time? Actively work to stem the tide of change with plastic surgery and shiny new sports cars? No. Look at what he says. Live in joy. Take pleasure in what you do and what you have. Live today with the gifts and blessings that God has delivered to you because who knows what tomorrow brings. This isn't an encouragement towards hedonism. This is the understanding that our lives are a divine gift as well as something fundamentally oriented towards God. God created all of it and called each and every moment good. So recognize it for what it is, God's gift to us. Crisis, change, death, they come to us all. Smart and dim-witted, clergy and faculty and laity, songstresses and the tenured. The wisdom of the world puts its, lots, its lot with those who enjoy the vainglorious victories of this world. But if we do the same, we've lost sight of the prize. Furthermore, this knowledge from above offers a stark recognition of the absolute unknowableness of God's plans. We might walk in intimate relationship with God, but don't confuse that with intimate knowledge of God's plans. Chaos and crisis are both part of the deal. Whatever God's, God wills, it's absolutely beyond our ability to know or intuit or predict, so go forward in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Does that mean that we won't experience these things? You bet we will. In fact, we know that we will. We find our rest in God. That is true wisdom. According to Jesus, your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is the joy of the Christian faith. Ecclesiastes, as read by James, says that rather than railing against change or suffering or death, consider this. Life is good. God gave all of this to us as his gift, and in this, God commands our joy, not our anger, not our militancy, but the sheer pleasure of a life as a child of God. This isn't pithy sentimentality. Should we put our heads in the sand and deny change? Do we barricade the doors against the secularism of the world and stand on the message of our unchangeableness? Well, I don't know about that, but as a Bible person, I can tell you this. This is the very marrow of the church. The world is a fleeting place, a puff of smoke. And what my varied career has taught me is this. Christianity has what the world wants, and what we have is joy. Let me share a small and poignant example of a world transformed by the crisis of evil in one man's search for God. And Simon Wiesenthal, in his 1960 work, The Sunflower, recounts his experience as an interred prisoner in a German concentration camp. He finds that when confronted with absolute human evil, there are no easy answers. Of his own suffering, simply because he is a Jew, he cries, everything was unreal and insubstantial, the earth was peopled with mystical shapes. God was on leave, and in his absence, others had taken over to give us signs and hints. Wiesenthal says God gives us signs and hints. What are they? Are they huge and magnificent momentous? Is this the chimera of personal success as a sign of God's favor? No. According to biblical wisdom, they are this, a child's hand in ours, a prayer whispered in the dark, human companionship, even in a grim and hopeless concentration camp. This is the small, subtle joy, and I will call it joy, of God's gifts if we have eyes to see. And God is manifestly present in each and every one of these lesser, indescribable moments, as fleeting as a breath or a puff of smoke. 
The rabbis say that scripture holds the answers to every question. But if you don't get an answer, it's because you either aren't asking the right question or you fail to recognize the answer that's right in front of you. As Ecclesiastes says, there is nothing new under the sun. Change, suffering, death, all part of the human equation. How you respond will decide whether you are wise or not. And as Wiesenthal himself found, seeking wisdom in the face of profound suffering does not end once a decision is made. In fact, if one is truly wise, you will consider and reconsider these things over and over again as you walk in the knowledge of God's grace each and every day. That is wisdom. That is theologia. Modern society can be a bleak and lonely place. Isolation and alienation are on the rise today, perhaps more so than at any other time in recent history. The warmth and acceptance that a church can provide offers a powerful draw to those distressed by the anarchy of modernity, where communications are now primarily as disembodied avatars, safe in the tissue of our anonymity. Therefore, the stakes are much higher now for the church to reinvent and reinvigorate its message for the modern and the lonely speaker, seeker. But the anarchy of modernity is also at odds with biblical wisdom. For the biblical writers, God is responsible for the patterns of life that we find around us. Faith in God is in, fact faith, is in fact a basic trust in the world that views all of God's creation as his gift to us. There is a God-given order to reality, maybe not to all the social agendas and special interests out there, but God created us all and set it all in motion and called it good. Our path is not to withdraw. If anything, we live in and amidst the chaos. So John Henry Cardinal Newman, quote, I sought to hear the voice of God and climbed the topmost steeple, but God declared, go down again. I dwell among the people. Speaking for myself, wisdom teaches me that the greatest gift that I have to share in the work that I do is not to construct fortifications against the world, but to recognize joy. The world will always be an uncertain place. Hebrews tells us we have no continuing city, yet God loves this world and called it good, all of it, even us, even me. Wisdom isn't found in rejecting this world as somehow not of God. Biblical wisdom has encouraged me to find joy in all the subtle gifts of God's creation, a devoted helpmeet for the road, my child's hand in mine, people who love me and whom I love in return, and the chance to talk about God's word as my life's work. Is there any greater wisdom than this, that life itself is a divine gift lived out in the modest moments of everyday living? That is my theologia and ultimately for all of us, our reason for being, our joy. Bishop Callistos Ware opens his wonderful book, The Orthodox Way, with the following story. One of the best known of the Desert Fathers of 4th century, century Egypt, St. Serapion the Side Knight, traveled once on pilgrimage to Rome. Here he was told of a celebrated recluse, a woman who lived always in one small room, never going out skeptical about her way of life, for he was himself a great wanderer, Serapion called on her and asked, why are you sitting here? To this she replied, I am not sitting, I am on a journey. Bishop Callistos continues, every Christian may apply these words to himself or herself. To be a Christian is to be a traveler. We are on a journey through the inward spaces of the heart, a journey not measured by the hours of our watch or the days of the calendar, for it is a journey out of time into eternity. I have been blessed by my journey, which really started here at Pittsburgh Seminary. I have measured much of my time since then, not in hours, but in the joy that I have felt in doing this work that I cannot imagine not doing. And for that, I am ever grateful. Thank you.